culture of hospitality. Highland hospitality, whereas if people were travelling long distances, they knocked at someone's door, maybe the weather turned, maybe a storm came in, there'd be an expectation that the culture was to offer food and shelter. But usually these travellers would be expected to give a story or a song or something in return. It was said there was a story, there was a, a saying that said, the first story from the man of the house, and then the guest entertains till dawn. So there's this, <laughs> I don't know if I can go till dawn. <laughs> Maybe until everyone gets bored or starts drifting off to sleep. But um, so they, these are some of the kind of this is the backdrop, this is the, the undercurrent of storytelling in Scotland today. And another interesting culture of work is this culture of the Cayley, which is in the old Older times it wasn't simply dancing, Cayley was just a gathering. And it'd be gathering like we are tonight in some kind of circle. And it wasn't a case of one person performs, it was a case of everyone would chip in something. So either someone might sing a song, someone would tell a joke, maybe someone brought the food or a cake or whatever. This is the way people gathered, and this is, I guess, how people entertained each other through the long, dark winters. Of course, the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know how much she contributes to the Scottish economy each year, but <laughs> she's, she's definitely doing her bit. She was first sighted, first recorded sighting was by St. Columba, when he came across from Ireland in the 1500s. He set up his, well, landed in Iona, of course, which is still a spiritual centre to this day, but he came up the Great, Great Glen Way, preaching to the, the Picts, bringing his word of the, the one true God as he saw it. And as he was coming up Loch Ness, he noticed a commotion at the side of the loch. And there were some locals gathered around a man who was half mangled and chewed. And they told him the story that he'd been mauled by the beastie. Very well, this is a fine opportunity to prove the power of his God, thought Columba. And he got one of his monks, obviously a man of strong faith, to go and swim out into the dark waters of Loch Ness. And now the fairies in Scotland, we need to, they're a strange bunch, and they're not, we need to get any idea of Tinkerbell or any other kind of flower fairies out of our heads, because in Scotland they believed, in fact, they were so well respected they wouldn't often even use the word fairy. They would call them the wee folk, or the good people, the Dina she. And they were said to be about this high. They would dwell in the forest or even in their homes underneath hills, conical hills. And sometimes, if you got on their good side, they would help you out. But at other times, well, woe betide anyone who crossed them. And what did he see in the forest floor but a tiny wee man? Quite small for a fairy, actually. <laughs> tiny <laughs> wee man. <laughs> brown coat, little green trousers, and he was running, looking up at the kestrel, trying to hide under a log. And as he saw this wee man, the woodcutter remembered the stories that his mother used to tell him when he was wee about the little folk who lived in the woods. Without thinking twice, he picked up a stone, he threw it into the air, not to hit the bird, but as it flashed past its beak, it shrieked and it fluttered away. It, it soared out in, an off, in the opposite direction. And with the danger gone, that wee fairy man got up. He brushed himself down and he turned to the woodcutter. You've helped me. You've saved my life. And for saving me, I have something to give to you. He reached into his pocket. He held out his hand, and above his hand glowed a little golden light. Take this wish, and wish for whatever will make you true happy. Well, the woodcutter grateful to the